My name is Jim Raleigh. I'll be talking to you tonight about two topics that are near and dear to my heart and hopefully will help you all out in one way, shape, or form. Uh, the topics for tonight are uh, problems that will afflict men uh, many times after surgery, but oftentimes not. Those being sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction, impotence, and sexual or uh, urinary tract symptoms, specifically incontinence. So we'll start today with erectile dysfunction. And uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time during the uh, discussion if you have questions. I'll be happy to answer them along the way. Or if you want, uh, at the end of the whole presentation, I'll give you an opportunity to ask uh, questions then. So erectile dysfunction, by definition, is the, ability, the inability to maintain an erection that's firm enough to allow a patient or person to have uh, successful intercourse. It's a very, very common condition, and it affects millions of American men. And most of these patients are afflicted by a condition that is physical and not emotional or mental. So in the good old days, we used to tell patients that it's all in your head. It's quite the opposite now. There's always a uh, physical uh, reason behind it in 90% of cases. There are a number of underlying causes that will predispose patients for this condition. Many of them are vascular in nature, meaning blood flow issues. Uh, there are a variety of reasons why a patient will have reduced blood flow, but the common ones include hypertension, coronary artery disease, plaque deposition, high cholesterol, diabetes, etc. In addition, diabetes on its own will cause a variety of other conditions, particularly small nerves or neurologic uh, events, which will reduce the ability uh, for the penis to get adequate blood flow. And then various medications, particularly antihypertensives, will contribute to the problem. You can see down uh, at the bottom there, pelvic surgery, radiation, or trauma accounts for only 6%. But for many patients who've had prostate surgery, they're in that 6% for the reasons that uh, we'll discuss later. Is erectile dysfunction something that you have to live with? Well, the answer is no, because there are correct correctable causes and treatments for it. These are uh, an outline of uh, some of the, the medications and, uh, and options that we typically advise patients to uh, undergo, and often in this order, starting off with oral medications, proceeding to vacuum erection devices, injectable therapy, urethral suppositories, and ultimately surgical intervention. The oral medications are effective in a good number of patients, particularly those who have their problems that are non-surgical in origin. Uh, patients who have diabetes or early uh, uh, vascular disease often are very much helped by these medications. They generally work only in response to sexual stimulation. So for the patient who takes the pill and sits around staring at himself for the next 20 minutes waiting for something to happen, it's not going to be an effective treatment. But if you take it about an hour before things are looking promising, get a sex sexually aroused in the appropriate time frame, the results are generally favorable and allow patients to have a successful uh, experience. Different medications last for a different amount of time. Uh, Viagra and Levitra classically last somewhere around four to six hours. Uh, Cialis is notorious for lasting longer. Uh, it was the uh, brand that successfully pioneered the 36-hour uh, concept or the weekender uh, medication. Um, they're all effective. Some patients like one more than the other. Some patients have more side effects with one compared to the other. So it's a trial and error uh, uh, experience for most uh, gentlemen. Uh, various types of meals, both alcohol and fat content, can affect uh, a patient's absorption of the medication. So particularly Viagra has to be, uh, that has to be taken under consideration. The pills are expensive. I mean, there's no way to escape that, unfortunately. Many insurances no longer even cover it, so you're paying for it out of pocket. I tell patients it's like going to a good movie. The oral medications have fairly classic side effects, headache being the most common, flushing feeling, runny nose, upset stomach being uh, other common side effects. Nitrates are the major consequence or major contraindication. So if you're taking antiangina medication uh, that is nitroglycerin based, you cannot take these medications. They're contraindicated. It's the only major contraindication uh, to this medication, and it can lead to non-reversible blood pressure drop. 
and that can potentially be fatal. So we're very strict about mentioning to patients whenever we prescribe this medicine, you can't be on nitroglycerin or even have it on uh, your person available to you because the temptation when you're having chest pain to take it is high, and if you have the chest pain because you've been having sex, it's a bad combination. Vacuum erection device is often the next line uh, approach for patients who uh, try and don't tolerate or try and fail the oral medications. Uh, the, advance, the advantage is, of course, that it's an on-demand and uh, non-permanent uh, treatment. Uh, it's very effective, it's not painful, and it's, uh, it's something that can be integrated into foreplay. You really need to have a very understanding partner. It's not great for guys who are on the dating scene because it is a little cumbersome and it does involve uh, some work. Very few side effects to this. The most common side effect is that it just doesn't work well enough, but it can be an excellent uh, uh, addition to the, uh, the treatments that we uh, employ. And some patients use this successfully in combination with oral medication to get extra blood flow. This is something that in our practice, we have uh, our nurse practitioner who's in charge of our ED rehab program She'll be helping uh, patients learn how to use this properly and teach them effective uh, uh, technique. Injection therapy is a very, very effective form of management. It's very intimidating for men to consider this, but once it's been properly taught, uh, it's an excellent option for patients who have failed uh, uh, prior therapeutic options. Uh, injection therapy relies on the fact that we're uh, using a drug that's injected directly into the spongy tissue that uh, collects the blood and creates an erection. This medication is a vasodilator, meaning that it will increase blood flow. And it increases it, unlike the other ones, it increases it regardless of sexual interest. In other words, you can give this to yourself and stare at yourself, and within five minutes you'll get an erection. And that erection, when we dose it properly, will typically last for anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes and will remain at that level fully erect, even after reaching a climax, which many of the oral medications will not allow a patient to sustain. So for obvious reasons, this is popular in the movie industry, but it's also very popular for men who have blood flow, but that blood flow needs to be augmented and oral medicines or vacuum devices are not working. The advantage, of course, that it's very effective and there's no side effects for the partner. There's no transmission of the medication. But the disadvantage is, is that there's a needle within a one yard radius of your penis, which a lot of guys find very intimidating. Just for your reassurance, the needle is a 30 gauge needle. Typically, it's the smallest needle that's made. It is not painful. It's the same needle that you would use in a TB skin test. Uh, most guys don't even feel it going in. Um, but you can have some pain locally at the site of injection or bruising, uh, and eventually with repeated use in the same general area, you can get uh, some scarring and possibly curvature. So it's just something to consider when uh, being taught uh, proper technique. Uh, priapism is a rare complication in patients uh, who uh, use this medication for good reason, but it is very common in patients who are using this technique for recreational purposes. In other words, they don't really need it, but they use it because they like having an erection that lasts for an hour and a half. Priapism is a situation where your erection lasts for more than four hours and doesn't go away. Uh, the condition is notorious uh, or has notoriety because of the commercial, particularly with Cialis. It says if you get an erection that lasts for four hours, stop taking the medicine. Well, as any of you know, if you've ever tried this, it's impossible to stop taking a medicine that you've already taken because it's already in you. Uh, but priapism is a unwanted and very uncomfortable complication that pretty much only exists with this treatment. And again, as I said, for guys who get decent erections but not great, who convince doctors that they want to try this treatment, they're the classic patient who gets priapism. Patients who really are not getting erections with any of the other options who try this virtually never get priapism. So it's not a realistic uh, risk for patients who really need this treatment. For others who can't tolerate the concept of a needle being anywhere near them, there's another option which I consider minimally invasive, and it's called MUSE. Uh, MUSE is a, a medical urethral suppository. Um, it's a, a technique for inserting a tiny uh, waxy pellet 
that gets dissolved with body temperature and releases a medication that will be a vasodilator or stimulator of blood flow. It's applied in the urethra or the tube that you pee through and it's uh, applied with a uh, applicator that you can see right here. Um, that little plunger device goes into the urethra and when you click the end like a clicking the, the clicker of a pen it will push a plunger down and that plunger literally just pushes out the waxy pellet. Waxy pellet is about the size, the length of a grain of rice, and the width of a lead pencil, one of those mechanical lead pencils. So it's really tiny. It's not a painful thing. It's just a little intimidating. Again, most patients don't like the idea of anything intruding on their uh, urethra. But once it's in uh, and you uh, heat up the penis by essentially rubbing it, um, you'll get a pretty good release of uh, a vasodilator through the urethral blood vessels. And for many men, it can lead to a sustained and, and good erection. Uh, very few side effects, mostly local, topical uh, discomfort, uh, maybe burning when you urinate. Um, but generally, it's not a major problem. And it must be refrigerated, so it's a little bit inconvenient. Um, it's not like uh, going in a cold shower, though. I mean, when you refrigerate it, it uh, you don't actually feel it being cold. Uh, penile implants are what we advise patients to have if they are unsuccessful with the conventional methods that we just talked about. Uh, penile implants have been on the market for over 30 years, and there are hundreds of thousands of men who have successfully used them. It sounds like an intimidating option, but for men for whom sexual experience is an important part of their quality of life, it's an excellent, excellent option because it allows you to restore function with a one-time procedure. It has a very high overall success rate and satisfaction rate. There's nothing more frustrating for a patient who want, than someone who wants to have sex, has tried everything unsuccessfully. So by the time they go to the penile prosthesis, they're generally thrilled if it works. So consequently, very high satisfaction rate uh, with it. If you look at the diagram here, the typical penile prosthesis has anywhere from one to three components. The one I use mostly is the one that has three components. That allows it to be inflatable. Component number one is placed um, in the shaft of the penis, and it replaces essentially the two cylinders that normally swell up with blood, the, the sponge tissue. There is a valve system, which is a pump basically, that will allow transfer of fluid from a reservoir, which is placed somewhat remotely, in other words, in the lower part of the abdomen, um, and you don't even know that it's there. It's placed, you know, as part of the surgery, and subsequently it's, it, it allows the fluid uh, to be stored there for later transference through the plumbing system into uh, the cylinder. This pump device is in the scrotum, or the, the sac where your testicles live. It's a pretty discreet uh, component, and it's under the skin, so no one, unless they really scrutinize the area, will notice it. But when you reach down and feel it, it feels like essentially a third testicle. And it can be squeezed. And what it will do is a very simple transference of fluid from the reservoir through the plumbing system into the uh, cylinders. When fluid goes in these cylinders, you get a flaccid penis becoming erect. And more than that, the penis gets longer and has more girth. So it replicates a uh, normal erection very well. All prosthetic devices are not able to account for the glands or the head of the penis uh, filling up with blood. Um, but having said that, the shortcomings are offset by the realistic nature of the, uh, of the erection that you get with the prosthesis. Um, some of the prosthetic devices that we use, uh, particularly the one made by AMS, who's actually sponsoring tonight's event, has a coating on it that reduces the risk of getting an infection. The major downside of these components, or any uh, mechanical component, is that they can get infected. And if they do, they have to be removed. So to reduce the risk of that being an issue, uh, the proprietary uh, coating called inhibizone is applied in the factory to this uh, component and it reduces the risk of an infection. So it's a, it's a valuable tool, and it's led to a, a very low rate of infections. It's designed for long-term use. 
we joke with our patients that it's got at least a 10-year warranty, but really the failure rate is very low and oftentimes related to simple things like poor technique or small leaks over time that happen with, uh, uh, with the joints that we have to create. 90% of patients report satisfactory erections and uh, those are durable benefits. And the nice thing about uh, the penile prosthesis is that it's not only highly recommended by the patients who've had it done and who've tried everything else, they're satisfied with it, but so are their spouses. Benefits, of course, are that it's a long-term solution to ED. It provides the ability to have an erection at any time of your choosing. So it's uh, very reliable and excellent on the dating scene. It enables you to maintain the erection as long as you want and it can be discreet, so if you want to wear a speedo bathing suit, you can by simply deflating it. The single component penile prostheses, which we rarely use, but for certain patients do work nicely, uh, are much simpler and don't have the three components. They only have the, the cylinders, and these cylinders are uh, malleable, meaning that they, they bend. And they can be basically bent down or bent up. And so it serves as a buttress or a strut so that when you're having normal uh, intercourse in the traditional way, uh, the cylinders don't buckle. But the disadvantages of those cylinders is that they don't expand in length or girth, and what you got is what you got. So um, the only thing that you can do is bend it up or down. Those I would not recommend a Speedo bathing suit for. Again, as we talked about, very few risks. Um, once the prosthesis is in, you can't go backwards. In other words, you can't say, well, you know what, I'd rather try medicine or I'd rather try the injections because this replaces the spongy tissue that would normally expand with, with blood flow. So the penile prosthesis is what we recommend for patients who have tried and unsuccessfully uh, tried prior options that we talked about earlier. It can cause pain, either short-term or long-term, which is unusual, and it can malfunction because it has moving parts and there's fluid that can leak. Um, it, the penis can scar. Anytime we're operating on the penis, dilating it, cutting into it, um, there can be scarring as a result, and so replacement or subsequent management uh, can be uh, more difficult. And of course, if there is an infection, as we talked about, it has to be removed. The summary of all this is that ED is a very common problem. There are effective and numerous treatments available. There's a hierarchy of treatments or a stepwise progression that we utilize, ranging from medicine to non-permanent uh, interventions to permanent uh, implants but they all have risks and benefits which we can tailor to a patient's uh, success rate and desires. The next topic that I'd like to talk about is a similarly troubling uh, uh, issue, uh, that being urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine when it's not appropriate or desired to lose urine. The anatomy of the urinary tract is actually very simple. The bladder, which lives behind the pubic bone and at the lower part of the abdomen, deep in the pelvis, is a bag of muscle which is designed to do two and only two things, store urine and empty urine. It does nothing else. It empties the urine by way of a tube called the urethra, which goes from the base of the bladder, like a funnel, through the prostate gland, and then out through the end of the penis. Between the bladder and the urethra is the prostate gland, which is a troublesome gland for men, and it keeps urologists in business. The prostate over time grows and can become cancerous, or both, and both of those have a set of problems that are associated with it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the major reason for men leaking is the control valve, which lives right here under the prostate. When that valve isn't functioning properly, men have a condition called stress incontinence. It's not called stress because you get stressed emotionally, it's called stress because when you put your body through a stress or an abdominal contraction, lifting, coughing, sneezing, sudden movement, golf swing, bowling, the pressure in the abdomen and in the pelvis overwhelms the muscle of control and you have involuntary loss of urine or incontinence. There are many different kinds of incontinence. Some are more easily treated than others, but they have various different causes. The broad names or the broad topics that we can talk about are stress urine incontinence, which I just talked about, which is where 
abdominal and pelvic pressure overwhelms the muscle of control. Urge incontinence, which is that sensation of, oh my God, I got to go and I got to go now, otherwise I won't make it in time. And in fact, you don't make it in time. And overflow incontinence, which feels very similar to urge incontinence, but is related to a different mechanism. Urge incontinence typically results from the bladder being what we would call hyperactive. It's contracting when it shouldn't. Normally, the bladder, as I said, is designed to store urine. Urgency incontinence arises when the bladder fails to store urine and it contracts. Rather than storing, it's trying to empty. Overflow incontinence arises when the bladder is actually overfilled or overdistended and the kidneys keep pumping more urine into it. Any additional urine doesn't have anywhere to go, so it overwhelms the muscle of control and you spill over. No different than when you fill your cup of coffee to the brim and then you keep adding to it. It'll just overflow into the... Uh, onto the table. So all three of these incontinence uh, uh, issues are managed differently, and it's our obligation as a urologist to identify which of the ones a patient has. What causes incontinence? Well, there are a variety of causes. One of the most common in men is prostate surgery of various kinds, typically cancer surgery where the prostate is removed, but less commonly but still possibly uh, transurethral or telescopic uh, shaving of the prostate. Additionally, other problems like diabetes, Parkinson's, MS, or other neurologic conditions, uh, stroke, spinal cord injury can cause it, pelvic trauma, and birth defects, specifically spina bifida. Male urinary incontinence is common, but really a pain in the neck. Practical issues such as extra laundry, the smell, the inconvenience, the skin irritation are all major problems that we have to deal with and the reason that patients come to see us. Treatment options range from impractical but necessary, absorbent products, diapers, etc., to collection devices, catheters or condom catheters, to external devices like penile clamps, Collagen injection, which are injectable balkening agents to essentially um, um, add to the strength of the urethral sphincter. And finally, surgical options, which we'll focus on. Unfortunately, unlike in women, where there are many medications that are available both for stress and urge incontinence, and many uh, products available for stress incontinence, men are much more limited. There's no FDA-approved medicine available for stress urinary incontinence in men. We're left with absorbent pads, which are really a pain both practically and expense-wise. We have external clamp devices, Cunningham and the C3 clamp. These are essentially like putting a, uh, uh, a vice grip around the penis. It's not particularly pleasant. It's not painful, but it's cumbersome. It's a bit uncomfortable and it doesn't really address the problem uh, fundamentally. It, it's a crutch, essentially. So they do work, and for patients who aren't surgical candidates, it's an option. Catheter devices, both internal catheters and external catheter collection systems, such as uh, the Texas or condom catheter, do work. They're very functional for patients who aren't candidates for other forms of management or who have failed other forms of management. They collect the urine nicely, they prevent leakage, they uh, prevent the need for pads, but they're attached to a leg bag, things can come disconnected, and from a, uh, uh, a standpoint of just aesthetics, a lot of patients object to it because they feel like they're really, A, old, and B, um, they have visions of uh, colostomy bags and other things that just aesthetically are not what they really want. Uh, I use this not as a method of least resort because it's not a, a, not, a, not a last resort kind of option, but an option when we've really tried everything else or a patient is just not a candidate for the uh, surgical options I'm about to discuss. Urethral injections work in a, limited, uh, in a limited way for patients. They work nicely for women, but for men, unfortunately, they're pretty ineffective. Less than 20% of patients have any benefit from injections uh, after prostatectomy. 
And the reason is, is that the male urethra just isn't set up for uh, a balconing agent. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it just, it's, not an, it's not an excellent option. So we do have two excellent options which are purely surgical in nature. One is the sling, the other is the artificial sphincter. The male sling, or the advanced sling, which is the one I use mostly, also again produced by AMS, who is our sponsor tonight, is a brilliant idea that was first adapted from women's urology into men, male urology. The basic functionality of this is to take a non-absorbable uh, uh, mesh, which has been FDA approved and is essentially uh, inert as far as its interaction with, uh, with the body, and place it under the urethra and use it to hoist the urethra or pull it back into normal anatomic location. The procedure is relatively quick. It's done in under an hour. It's done as an outpatient, and it's highly effective for mild to moderate incontinence of the stress variety. It's not useful for neurogenic bladder. In fact, it may make symptoms worse. And the neurogenic bladder or nerve-related bladder incontinence is a completely separate topic, which is almost always medically managed. This works great for stress incontinence of the right kind. So we would do a proper evaluation for patients, make sure that the anatomy is suitable for this, and then recommend placement if they have mild to moderate incontinence. What that means is zero to three pads a day. The pads aren't totally soaked, but the patient is inconvenienced by the incontinence, and it prevents them from enjoying quality of life. The product is non-absorbable, so it lasts indefinitely, and it essentially gets integrated with one's normal tissue. So it's a highly effective, relatively low-risk management. It's, if one looks at the pelvis, th these are the pelvic bones face on. The urethra will come up here, heading up towards the penis. The legs would be out on the sides. The backside is here. The sling goes through two natural openings that are in the pelvic bone and are approached by two puncture sites, one in each groin, and one small incision in the perineum, which is the area that would be in contact with a bicycle seat. It's between the anus and the scrotum. The incision, because of its location, is almost invisible, and it's relatively small, and because it doesn't go through any major muscle groups, it heals very rapidly and is minimally painful. The sling acts like a buttress and, as I mentioned earlier, pulls the urethra back into normal anatomic location, and that's how it works. The resolution of normal continence in mild to moderate incontinence is in the high 90% range, and it's immediate. So patients wake up from the operating room, and they're most of the time totally dry. So it's very effective, very quick, and has a good durable result. Advance is not for certain kind of people. It's not for people who have an active infection and that's what's causing their incontinence. It's not meant for patients who are on blood thinners because this is a um, surgical procedure. Part of it is blind, meaning we're putting uh, needles around corners where we can't see. And so puncturing of blood vessels in those, uh, in those conf uh, confined areas can lead to bleeding that if it doesn't stop on its own can lead to a big problem. So in general, Blood thinners, such as Coumadin, uh, are a contraindication to virtually all of our surgical interventions. Compromised immune system, meaning you can't fight infection well, would be another um, reason why we would elect not to put this in. For patients who are not a good candidate because their incontinence is too bad for a sling, the next level, which is sort of the Cadillac or platinum version of incontinence management, is the urethral sling. If you imagine the urethral sling as a floaty device the kids would have around their arms to prevent them from sinking in a swimming pool, the urethral sling looks just like that. It involves a cuff, which looks like the floaty device, which wraps around the urethra, a tubing system, which goes to a pump, which, just like in the um, penile prosthesis, is housed in the scrotum, and then a reservoir, which is again housed in the abdomen, that stores the fluid. Now this storage device, unlike the uh, erection mechanism, this storage device is under pressure. 
and at rest, so when you're not actively dealing with this, the pressure is such that it actually forces the fluid into the cuff. When you're not thinking about it, you want that cuff to be inflated, tightly compressing the urethra, because you want to be continent. It's like your resting valve is turned on. That's how you want to work day to day. Now, when you want to urinate, you don't want the valve on. So in order to urinate, you actively depressurize or pump out the fluid from the reservoir. So you're taking it or from, the, uh, from the cuff. You're taking it from the cuff and pumping the fluid out into the reservoir. If you wait two minutes, the pressure will force the fluid back in. But in those two minutes, you'll have already urinated and have an empty bladder. So it's a very nice system that's compatible with day-to-day -day quality of life. You don't even know you have it on minute to minute, but when you have to urinate, you simply decrease, uh, decrease the resistance in the valve and let Mother Nature take over. And then the valve uh, system will uh, repressurize and allow the fluid to go back. So it's a very, very effective system. Um, this is a graphic display of how it looks. When the bladder is full, you want the cuff to be uh, filled with saline and compressing. When you want to pee, you force the fluid out of the cuff into the reservoir, allows proper urination, and then the cuff will refill. As I mentioned, it's the gold standard because it works the best. It's also the most complicated of the surgeries. And very similar contraindication and risk to the penile prosthesis. It's a multi-component uh, process. There's the risk of infection. And if it is infected, it has to be removed, and then we have to try again at a later date. It is highly successful in patients who are good candidates for it, working well over 90% of the time. And it is reserved typically for the significant incontinence patient who either has failed a sling or who is too bad to even consider a sling. Again, not for men who've had uh, you know, prior bleeding disorders, uh, low immune system, or patients who have other causes for their incontinence who would not do well if there's added resistance to flow. Because of the coating of this uh, component, uh, certain antibiotic uh, allergies are also making it a, a, a poor choice. I'd be happy to answer questions now about my talk or about your own questions that you may have that are unrelated to the specifics that we talked about tonight. I thought I read some while ago that Botox was used on the uh, urinary Correct. So for those of you who don't know, Botox is a uh, poison <clears throat> that is uh, the, the poison behind botulism. Uh, also known as lockjaw. Uh, botulism will uh, paralyze muscles, essentially. Um, and the way that it works for the majority of people is that when you have wrinkles, for instance, in your forehead or by your eyes, it's due to muscle spasm. And to relieve those wrinkles, you inject Botox. Well, someone came up with the brilliant idea, well, if we can inject it safely for cosmetic reasons, maybe we should try it in a bladder and in which bladders would you inject it? Well, you'd inject it into bladders that are hyperactive. So the, the classic patients that, were, that it works well for are patients who have true spasticity of their bladder, usually a spinal cord disorder or a neurologic condition, who don't respond well to oral medicines and who need extra help. So Botox in the right setting is an effective tool it's not universally reimbursed, so it's, there's a cost potential issue there. And um, there are a whole new set of problems that arise from the fact that now the bladder is essentially paralyzed because a patient has to be willing to, um, to potentially catheterize themselves. So you'll go from being incontinent because your bladder can't store to storing too well and not being able to empty. But again, for the right candidate, it's an excellent option in certain situations. This is a little bit off the subject, this question. I had a uh, epidural shot in the hip, mm -hmm. and the injection was given in the groin area. Okay. Okay. So after my follow-up visit, you know, I was talking to the doctor, and I should have asked the doctor at the time. She said, he said, did I have any uh, urinary 
come and said, I have an urinary abscess. And I said, no. Do you know why So, most of the time when patients are getting injections uh, for nerve root pain, uh, it's because of a, a pinched nerve that arises at the level of the spinal cord from a disc. So, where the nerves are exiting the spinal cord, uh, the discs are putting pressure. These are small openings, and any kind of compression will affect the nervous function. Certain kinds of disc disease will cause not only pain with the peripheral nerves that supply the muscles and, and, and pain sensation to the leg, but will also affect bodily functions such as bowel and urinary function. So to get an understanding as to how severe the disc problem is, we want to know if patients are having changes in their urinary or bowel function. And that's typically why that question would be asked. Because it points to a different diagnosis and a different management and a different... Um, a different urgency to the management. So if you all of a sudden start losing control of your urine and it's disc or spinal cord based, that becomes a medical emergency that requires surgical intervention rather than um, steroid injection for, for pain control. So if I were to have another one, I... Well, I no, no, no. You're, you're not actually endangering yourself from the injection. Um, so they're trying to get extra knowledge as to how severe the, the disc impingement is on the nerves and where specifically the problem lies. Is it cord or peripheral nerve based? That's typically why they ask the question. Should not, but again, keep an eye on it and it, and it may lead to a change in direction of your management if you are in fact noticing changes in your urinary or bowel patterns. All right, well thank you for spending an hour with me tonight.